So uh, excited to present some recent work uh, in algorithmic game theory, which is a very active and impactful area of research at the interface of theoretical computer science and game theory. And the story of algorithmic game theory has been a story of impressive bad news. Uh, central solution concepts in game theory like Nash equilibria have been shown to be computationally hard. Uh, this essentially means that these key concepts like equilibria or these key concepts, they does not exist polynomial time algorithms that compute these equilibria in general. But this is not the end of the story. We have to address this bad news. And, and the rationale is as follows. Equilibria are widely used in game theory. So at a high level, games study strategic interactions. For example, games are used to understand strategic interaction like auctions, markets, traffic networks, and their games are also used in the study of things like social or biological systems. And equilibria in games model outcomes of these strategic interactions. So for, say, for the prediction of outcomes of a particular strategic interaction, we need algorithmic tools. We need tools that address these hardness results, that address these complexity barriers. So motivated by these con considerations in this talk, I'll present positive results. And by positive results, I mean results that sort of identify settings or identify things that can be done efficiently, as opposed to these negative hardness results that uh, identify limits of efficient computation. And in particular, I'll, in this talk, I'll focus on Nash equilibria, which is one of the most central solution concepts in game theory. So I'll formally define Nash equilibria in later slides, but let me give you a high level description of this equilibria to begin with. So these equilibria, so in games you have players, players are self-interested entities, and players have payoffs. So players pick some actions to maximize their own payoffs. And uh, these equilibria at a high level denote distributions where players cannot benefit by unilateral deviation. So they're stable in this in this sense. They're stable in the sense that if everyone, if every other player sticks to what it's doing, a player cannot benefit by unilaterally doing something else, going to some other distribution over its actions. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of application pull for studying uh, algorithmic results for Nash equilibria, but uh, these are computationally hard. In a recent line of deep results. It's been shown that even in the case of two player games, games where I only have two players, it's computationally hard to find an underlying Nash equilibrium. But this hardness result has to be added. There's many applications that require us to find the underlying Nash equilibrium. So at the core of algorithmic game theory, there are questions about computation of Nash equilibrium. So the goal here is to understand, given the payoffs of the players, under what settings can we efficiently compute Nash equilibria? Okay? Under what settings can we address these underlying hardness results? And this is an important question from an applications perspective, but I would like to say that this is an important question from, for fundamental reasons as well. And the point is that equilibria model behavior, or model outcomes of strategic interaction between human players, play, or organizations <coughs> run by human agents. So what these hardness results say is that equilibria requires human players to have solved a computationally hard problem. Now this is a problem for the, this is a questionable premise for the model itself. If the equilibrium requires a computationally hard problem to be solved by a human player, we have to re rethink the model. So with this in mind, again, this sort of understanding when we can efficiently compute equilibria is important for, for these this fundamental uh, reasons as well. And in, uh, so now, uh, let me move on to the positive results and uh, that address these complexity barriers. And a very natural approach, a very sort of classical idea in computer science is to, in fact, relax the output requirement. These Hardness results say that computing an exact Nash is computationally hard. 
but intuitively one can think of computer relaxing this output requirement and studying the question of uh, is is it possible to compute an approximate Nash equilibrium efficient? I mean, I formally define what I mean by approximate Nash equilibrium, but the goal here is to understand if, given the payoffs of the players, is there an efficient algorithm that finds approximate Nash equilibrium? And this, in fact, is a central open question in algorithmic game theory today. That does there exist a polynomial time algorithm that for two players, even in games with two players, finds an approximate Nash equilibria in polynomial time. And the first part of the talk, I'll present results that will speak to that or address this central open question of <coughs> computation <coughs> approximate Nash equilibria. So as I said, this is sort of looking at approximate and sort of relaxing the output requirement is a typical approach in theoretical computer science. But let me now step back and uh, describe a complementary approach to obtain positive results, a complementary approach to address these negative hardness results that in fact focuses on the input side of this picture rather than the output side. And this complementary approach is based on a perspective that's quite prevalent in economics and game theory, but it, it's somewhat unconventional in theoretical computer science. And the idea is that in many strategic settings, economists don't observe these payoffs. These payoffs are unobserved theoretical constructs. For example, if you, for an economist, a consume, the utility of a consumer is not observed. What, what an economist or a observe is what are the choices of the consumer. What did the consumer buy and not what the inherent utility is. So, uh, these, since these payoffs are unobserved, <coughs> this is not our input. Uh, typically, what, what's, what's, what's the input, what's given to us is in fact observed behavior. It's the choices that are made by the players. So now, uh, with, in this setup, we in fact have some flexibility. What I mean is that, for a given a potential, given a specific observed behavior, uh, it, a, a specific observed behavior can in fact potentially be explained by different payoffs, right? And by that I mean there are different payoffs such that the equilibria of these payoffs correspond to the behavior. This is a bit of a subtle point and I'll sort of get back to that later in the talk. But just to give you an example, say I observe the behavior of players, they kind of pick some actions. Uh, what, what I can do is explain their behavior via payoffs which are either in rupees or in dollars. So the game and the underlying equilibria, the strategies and the sort of behavior doesn't change by the scale in which I specify the payoffs. So there is some inherent flexibility in these uh, payoff specifications. This is a very simple example. The point is much more subtle than that. But the point is, remains that for a specific observed behavior, I can have potentially different payoffs that explain this observed behavior. And in the second part of the talk, I'll present results that will leverage this flexibility to again address the hardness results for equilibrium. So that's the outline of the talk. Two parts. And if that's clear, let me move on to some technical results. So uh, let me first talk about computation of approximate Nash equilibria, and in particular show uh, consider the case of two games, games where I have two uh, self-interested players. Now, uh, this is sort of a common setup, but just to make sure everyone is on the same page, these two player games represent settings where two self-interested entities simultaneously select an action to maximize their own payoff. Right. So to kind of get this uh, model right, let me just use a very simple example. And typically in these games, I list out the payoffs of the players as matrices. There so are two matrices. The first <laughs> matrix is the payoff of the first player. The second matrix is the payoff of the second player. And these matrices just list out the payoffs of the players in the sense that the actions of the first player index the rows of these matrices and the actions of the second player index the column of columns of these matrices. So let's consider the game of rock, paper, scissors. I have two players. Both players have three actions, rock, paper, and scissors. The actions of the first, let's say the first player plays rock, and the second player plays scissors. So the first player wins, and we read off the payoff, which is one. So the first player wins, it's a payoff of one. And when the first player is playing rock, the second player is playing scissors, the second player loses and gets a payoff of minus one. 
So for every possible action choice in the two players, I can simply read out their payoffs from these two players. So that's a two player game. That's an example of a two player game. What's noticeable about this example is that here there's no stable deterministic strategy. So if the first player deterministically decides to always play rock, then the second player can deterministically decide to always play paper and will always defeat the first player. So that's not in the best interest of a rational or a smart first player. So in this setting, to understand stable outcomes, we have to consider settings where players randomize. That is, the players pick an action based on some distribution. So the first player will pick an action, i.e. one of the rows, based on some distribution. And the second player will take one of its actions, i.e. one of the rows, one of the columns, based on one of these distributions. So let me kind of generalize this uh, a bit of notation. Throughout the talk, I'll use matrices A and B to represent the payoffs of the two players. So our two players, the both players in our generality have 10 actions, and I have this matrix that lists out the payoff of the first player, and I have this matrix B that lists out the payoffs of the second player. So first player plays action I, second player plays action J, payoff of the first player is AIJ, payoff of the second player is BIJ. As, <coughs> as I mentioned before, to understand stable outcomes, to understand stable strategies, we have to consider probability distribution. So I'll use X and Y to denote probability distributions over the rows and the columns respectively. So here, the first player picks an action, picks a row based on distribution x, and the second player picks an action, picks a column based on distribution y. Now with this notation in hand, the definition of Nash equilibria is quite intuitive. It denotes a pair of probability distribution where no player can benefit by unilateral deviation. So let me pass through these inequalities. So the left hand side of the first set of inequality is the expected payoff of the first player. A is the payoff rate of the first player, and <coughs> both players are playing according to distribution x and y. I just do this term by term product. And what I get is that the expected payoff of the first player is x transpose a y. And what this inequality says is the first player cannot benefit by unilaterally going to some other distribution. So if the second player sticks to distribution y, then first player cannot increase its payoff expectation by following some other distribution. And similarly, for the second player, if the first player sticks to distribution x, the second player cannot benefit by really actually deviating some other distribution. So now from a technical standpoint, the uh, problem of computation of Nash equilibria is the following. I'm given two matrices A and B, and I want to find two distributions x and y that satisfy these inequalities. And as I mentioned, this is a computationally hard problem. That is it's unlikely that there exists an efficient polynomial term algorithm that finds these such distributions. So now let me relax the notion and consider an approximate Nash equilibrium. And the idea is to kind of look at the following definition, which is quite standard in game theory. It's a very practical and natural definition. And the idea is that uh, let's allow for a slap of epsilon. That is, that uh, an approximate Nash equilibrium is a pair of probability distributions. Well, the players cannot benefit more than epsilon by unilaterally. So I add this slack of epsilon on the right hand side to get x and y to be an approximate Nash equilibrium. So this is saying that this, if there's some inertia to changing distribution, so there's some, the players are not optimizing to the last bit, then you get an approximate Nash equilibrium. And central open question in the work we gave here today is to find an efficient algorithm that finds such distributions for given matrices A and B. So the computation of equilibria is a, has a long and deep like the area of research. As I mentioned, it's a computationally hard problem. So it's not surprising that the best known algorithm for finding exact Nash, Nash equilibrium runs in exponential time. This is an old algorithm by Lenthe and Hausen. Uh, but there are notable, notable <coughs> classical games where exact Nash equilibria can be computed efficiently. Um, of note are these zero sum games. So these are games where the sum of the two payoff matrices A and B is all zero. So these games model perfect competition. So whatever the first player wins, 
exactly equal to what the second player loses, and so on. So the rock, paper, scissor example I gave you was a zero sum game. Sum these two ways, you see, entry by entry I get all zeros. By the celebrated minimax result of one Hermann and by LP duality, one can find exact Nash equilibria in zero sum games in polynomial time. Again, there are other interesting classes of games like you know, the work that was done in IIT Bombay that identifies like classes of games where I mean exact Nash can be computed as well. This is how it says that if the rank of the sum of the two payoff matrices A plus B is one, then again you can find an exact Nash equilibria in polynomial time. Now moving on to the approximate side of things. The best known algorithm for finding an approximate Nash equilibria runs in time n to the log n, so an epsilon Nash equilibria. It's a sort of famous result by Lipton, Markakis, and Mehta. This gives a quasi polynomial time algorithm for computing approximate Nash equilibria in two variables. So, in trying to understand whether this can be reduced to a polynomial is a really important question in the game theory. And again, there are specific classes of games where approximate Nash equilibria can be computed efficiently. And there's a recent deep result by Noga Alon and others that shows that if the rank of the sum of the payoff matrices is small, so I give you a game where A is the payoff matrix of the first pair, B is the payoff matrix of the second pair, and the rank of this matrix A plus B is small, then again you can find an exact <coughs> Nash, an approximate Nash equilibria in polynomial. I'm ignoring like, the poly terms here for ease of so the result I'll present today will actually contribute to this line of work and we'll consider a very natural measure of, uh, of games, the sparsity of the games. And I'll define this measure uh, formally in the next slide. But what I do want to mention and what kind of distinguishes this result from prior work is that it interpolates across the entire spectrum of games. So for games that are near zero sum with respect to the sparsity measure, we'll in fact get a polynomial time algorithm for computing approximate Nash. And for general games, the running time of algorithm that I'll mention will in fact match the best known upper bound of Lipton Markakis. So in terms of the sparsity, it will go from this zero sum polytime case to this general result of Lipton Markakis. And here's the formal definition of sparsity. It's quite natural. I look at a game where A and B are the payoff matrices for the two players. And now I look at the matrix A plus B. And it defines sparsity to be the number of non-zero entries in any column of this maximum number of non-zero entries in any column of this matrix A plus B. So I have this matrix, I sum it up. If every column, let's say, has at most S non-zero entries, then the sparsity of the game is S. And it's a quite, I mean, it's a one can think of it as a robust notion of uh, zero sum. A zero sum model perfect competition where whatever one player loses is exactly equal to what the second player wins. And here the idea is in most, let's say in most settings, what for the one for the first player loses is exactly equal to what the second player wins, except for a few exceptions. Odd cases where both players lose or both players win, and those are like the non-zero entries of this matrix A plus B. So with this definition in mind, the formal is it that in real life scenarios that those non-zero ones are the only ones we care for. Sure, I mean, yeah, you can you can have a you can have a setting where every entry is just zero. Both are getting zero, and there's one entry where both are getting ten. So they'll just play that. That's a that's just a so yeah. In the light of that, how would you justify this line of exploration? So it's, I mean, that's one case, but that's not necessarily what will always happen. It might be the case that, uh, yeah, you have, yeah, it's just saying that uh, money doesn't fall from the sky. So, so, so it's a general result. So for those specific cases, yeah, you can do something. But and here you have talked about sparsity, but I mean, rank and sparsity uh, are sort of related, but is there any comment on that? So rank is sparsity in like the spectral domain. But the results are somewhat, I mean, they are, they are technically sort of different. The point being, so I did think about like, try, trying to port this result or uh, get like you know, Alon's result or something of that sort. But the, uh, the change of basis, if you will, like, going from this like, to the spectral, it kind of blows the approximation. Error. So I mean, I'm not, it's still sort of ongoing work whether one can connect the two. But 
in and of itself, the two results are incompatible. And what do I mean? And let's look at the, uh, let's say, uh, A plus B is the identity matrix. Right? This, uh, one, 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 A plus B. So it's a full rank matrix. So in that case, and this is out of the question. It's exponentially large. Right? It's even worse than uh, this quasi polynomial. It's full rank. But for me, if A plus B is the identity, it's just a, it's sparsity is one, and I'm good. I mean, I can find approximate match in poly time. On the flip side, I can give you a matrix which just A plus B is all ones. So rank is one, so you can apply uh, this advanced result. But on the other hand, sparsity is just completely dense. But I would like to mention that I'm just working with this definition for ease of presentation. The definition is much more robust. Like you can have small entries, you can zero it out, the result will hold. You can look at linear combinations of these matrices, and if it's that sparse, I mean, the result I'm about to mention will hold. A and B can be individually sparse, and again, this result will hold. It's just for one key result that I'm working with this definition. So with this definition in mind, the formal theorem state, OK. Here's a, let me make this thing concrete. If I look at my rock, paper, scissors example again, then uh, this was a zero sum game. So the sum of these two matrices is all zero. So the sparsity here is zero. All columns are zero. zero. And in general, the sparsity can be at most n, right? These are n cross n matrices. Number non zero entries in any column can be at most n. So, I mean, there's a technical caveat. For me, sparsity is always max of 2 and 0, but for ease of presentation, we'll stick with this definition. And here's the formal theorem of the statement. What we can show is that in an S sparse game, the sparsity is as defined, one can find an approximate Nash equilibria in time n to the log s. And the dependence on epsilon is as shown here. And as is typical, the payoffs are sort of normalized between minus 1 and 1. And the useful implications of this result is that when S is fixed, the game is near zero sum. So per column, I have a fixed number of non-zero entries. Then S is fixed, log S is fixed. I get a polynomial time algorithm for computing approximate function. And in general, I mean, S can be at most n. These are n cross n matrices. So in that case, the running time of the algorithm matches the best known upper bounds of the algorithm. So it completely interpolates based on this natural sparsity measure. So that's the sort of theorem statement I wanted to mention. Let me digress for a couple of slides and talk about the key technical construction that goes into proving this result. And it might seem a bit distant, but after describing the result, I can connect it back to approximate Nash equilibria. And that's what's coming up is the key technical takeaway of the talk. If you want one technical takeaway from today's talk, that, that's the result that's going to come up now. And the result is an approximate version of Calcidari's <coughs> fundamental theorem. So Calcidari's theorem is a classical result in quantum geometry. It's a hundred old, over a hundred year old theorem. And what it says is that if I give you a set of vectors, it doesn't matter how many, uh, if I give you a set of vectors, and all these vectors lie in d dimensions, so d dimensional vectors, then any vector w in the convex hull can be expressed as a convex combination of at most d plus one, some d plus one of these dis. So pick any w in the convex hull, you can always write w as a convex combination of at most d plus one of these dis. It doesn't matter how many dis you have. Now, uh, let us now consider a very natural approximate version of this theorem. And let me begin by mentioning that this bound of d plus one is tight. There is, it's not too hard to construct examples, particular vectors, w, that, it, to, that require exact, d, exactly d plus 1 of these vi's to be expressed exactly. But here's a natural approximate version. So let's pick a norm p, any arbitrary norm, vector norm p, greater than equal to 2. And what one can show is that for every vector w in the convex hull, so w might require d plus 1 vi's, but it doesn't matter where w is in the convex hull, there always exists a vector w prime that's epsilon close to w in this p norm. So for, for all w, there's a, there exists w prime, epsilon close, such that this dy vector can be expressed as a convex combination of at most 4p over epsilon squared dy. 
So there's some scaling going on that I'll mention. And I, because I'm looking at relative error, there's a formal theorem statement that I'm given this set of vectors, and all these vectors just for scaling, and the result for is more generally <coughs> for scaling the p norm of all these vectors for any norm p greater than or equal to z most norm. So I give you vectors, they lie on or inside the p or the ball. And what the theorem says is that for every vector w in the convex hull, is an epsilon closed vector w prime, the convex combination of at most 4 p over so square p. And what's noticeable about this result is that it's dimension p. d, the underlying dimension, does not make an appearance in this theorem state. So if you are in a million dimension, doesn't matter. If you allow an error of epsilon, you can find a vector by that's epsilon close that only requires 4 p over epsilon square p. So the proof of how this theorem uses Kinchin's equality, one can also instantiate from Mori's empirical method from Banach space theory to prove this result. In the interest of time, I'll not uh, go into proving this result, but I'll be happy to talk about it offline. There are many other interesting algorithmic applications that I have and, and still working on. So the point is, how does this approximate calc theory connect back to Nash equilibria? The idea is to just Let's go back to the Swerpy question. Sure. Is this uh, U prime? Is it in the convex hull? It is, it is. So, so it's a guaranteed in, in the convex. And you can sort of by randomized algorithm, you can very easily find it. If, if you go down. Yeah, just like this to make the C's and so on. So, how does this connect back to Nash equilibria? There's a very high level idea of the connection. Let's go back to the definition of approximate Nash. And notice that x and y are probability distributions. Right? x is a probability distribution for the row pair, y is a probability distribution of the common pair. And so ay is in fact a vector that lies in the convex hull of the columns of A. So A1, A2, A3, these are the columns of this matrix A. And y is a probability vector, so ay is a vector in this convex hull. So that at a high level connects Kapsdari to Nash and this number of technical details that go into proving using this approximate category to prove Nash. In the interest of time, I'll just give this high level picture. If you're interested, I'm very happy to spell it. So this one the previous year, go back to the or rather the next slide. Previous this one. Ha, this one. Yeah. So uh, can I actually choose I believe I can actually choose these uh, the vector, see if I order them 1, 2, 3, plus 1, yeah. right, or you know, I can take uh, simplex. And I can in fact take a consecutive interval of maybe twice the, is that true? So, uh, okay, I'm missing the sort of question. So, uh, for W or for W prime? No, I, I'm just saying that, is, is there, uh, is it, can I actually pick, is it uh, to do with, you know, the approximation of, say, in the F norm of, yeah. By sparse vectors, or you know, is that some, is that some I mean, there is certainly some connection to like sparse. I mean, this is like for there is sparse approximation to W. That's exactly what I'm saying. But I mean, high dimensions or this numbering is not. I mean, the point is, yeah, the uh, yeah, you can pick different Ws for different convex combinations for Ws, and that is. Result, okay. potentially result in different W prime. This is just saying there exists at least one such W prime, there could be many yeah. such W prime. Yeah. Going back to the original result. Yeah. So given a W you can find B plus one vectors, yeah. you can yeah. represent that. But yeah. will there exist a B plus one that can uh, be Bombay obviously combined to give all the points that are no. so for each point it will be a different set. Yeah, there's some subset. <coughs> Like just look at the, like the plane in this room, right? I can partition it into two triangles. So if you're in this triangle, I need these two. And if you're in this triangle, I need these two. Yeah, I mean, So, yeah, talk about this result, like this, com this combination of uh, approximate Nash in these past games. I've also considered the problem of computation of approximate Nash equilibria in multiplayer games. So games where there are more than two players. And in joint work with uh, Yakov Babichenko and Ron Perez, we present the best known algorithm for finding approximate Nash equilibria in multiplayer games. So 
specifically we consider games where we have m players in interactions where m is greater than or equal to 2 and we give the state of the art algorithm, the best known result for computing the approximate Nash equilibria for the case when the number of players is sort of comparable to the number of actions of each player. And the running term of our algorithm is capital N to the log log capital N, where capital N is the input size of such a game. So I have M players. Uh, each player has n actions, so I have this m tuple with n possible choices for each coordinate. The number of action profiles is n to the m, and for each action profile, I have m possible utilities for each of the players. The input size of such a game is, is capital N, and what we show is that one can find an approximate Nash equilibria for these large games in tying capital N to the log log the, the dependence on epsilon is. And, uh, and this result uses an interesting uh, concentration bound for product distributions. A bit more qualitatively, what we do is sort of exponentially improve upon the running time bounds for multiplayer games for by Lipton Markakis and Meta and other result of this kind of result right here. And so that sort of wraps up my first part of the talk. I talked about computation of Nash equilibrium, <coughs> Nash equilibrium, and the problems I considered, I was given these payoffs for two players for many years. And I talked about algorithms that computed approximate Nash equilibrium. And again, let me step back and go, go to this complementary approach that I had mentioned earlier that, uh, for positive results. And the idea here is uh, that in many settings, payoffs are unobserved. If what we have, what's given to us as input, is in fact the choices of the players. If you look at the, the, so what we, the our input is observed behavior, and we have some flexibility in sort of uh, the payoff specification. In particular, for a specific observed behavior, you could have multiple payoffs that explain this observed behavior in the sense that you can have multiple payoff matrices such that the equilibrium of these matrices correspond to the observed behavior. So let me be a bit more formal about it. So let's formalize observed behavior as a collection of probability distribution. So these are the observed equilibrium statements. So I have a couple of probability distribution x1, y1. So in observation one, player one picks distribution x1, player one picks distribution y1. In observation two, the second observed equilibrium strategy, <coughs> first player picks x2, the second player picks distribution y2, and so on. So I have this collection of probability distribution tuples. And now for any such collection, for any such observed behavior, <coughs> I could have multiple games such that the equilibria of both these games correspond to this given set of uh, tuples of probability distribution. So it's possible. Now, the point is that some of these games can be computationally hard, and some of these games can be computationally easy. And what do I mean? Well, by prior work, we know that games in which the rank of one of the payoff matrices is small, those games are computationally easy. In the sense that when the rank of one of the payoff matrices is small, we can find all Nash equilibria of such games in polynomial time. So given a specific observed behavior, I can have a computationally simple explanation, a computationally simple payoff, low rank payoff matrices such that the the equilibria of these matrices contain all these observed strategies, or I can have a computationally hard game that explains these observed behaviors, this, this given set of properties. Both are supposed to be optimal? So there is no optimality. So it's, it's an important point here that this is a testing exercise. A learning prediction, all these are important problems going ahead. All I'm saying is that here's this sort of set of observed equilibrium strategies. Can you give me a uh, completely simple game, which is formalized by rank, that uh, sort of explains these uh, observes? So, what are those probability distribution x1, x2? So, they are equilibrium. They are potentially observed equilibrium. So, equilibrium means optimal. So, x1 minus is an is equilibrium for a comma b. So, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a potential equilibrium, so you don't know what a, a and b is. Correct, okay, but yeah, assuming that, that yeah, yeah. So as you you want to find A and B such that these are equilibrium, equilibrium of this. 
<coughs> it could be A and B that, that so thing. unknown A and B, but x and y one are known equilibria of that unknown A and B. So here I'm giving you equilibria. I'm trying to understand can you find make computationally simple matrices that uh, for which these are actually equilibria. But then there <coughs> could be case that I can give you a distribution so that no game can explain the map. So modulo those cases. Yeah, these are so absurd equilibrium strategies. You want to find computationally simple games there, and which the, the Premise is an Occam's razor argument. You uh, sort of simple explanation, a computationally simple explanation, more likely. But yeah, but these would be then linear inequalities in the variables of A and B. Sure. So these are linear. So you can always test whether there's some matrix that satisfies. But when I have this rank constraint, then it's it's. it's so then you have these linear spaces which you have to check with the rank. Exactly. Yeah. But and uh, results are just constructed and sort of. Uh, so in joint work with uh, Umang Bhaskar, Frederick Fetzenik, and Adam Newman, what we do is sort of identify properties of this observed behavior, properties of these observed equilibrium strategies uh, that quantitatively connects to low rank games, that quantitatively connects to computationally simple games. Uh, just to uh, give you a specific <coughs> example of our result, what we show is that I give you equilibrium strategies that have small support. So you have x1, y1, x2, y2, so on and so forth. And each of these have small support. These are small support distribution. Each of them has support size s. And you can always find, and they are generic. Then you can always find a game of rank 2s plus 1, such that the equilibria of this game correspond to or contain the observed This support s is going to be two sparsity s. It does not. It's a completely different result. Repeat that again. What is this s So x1 minus x is a, so let's say I have only two distribution. X1 is a distribution over n, it's a distribution over the rows. Y1 is a distribution over columns, again a distribution over n. And let's say both X1 and Y1 have small support. <coughs> X1 only uses S uh, rows and it's, it puts non-zero probability on at most S rows. And so, and even X, I look at the second observation, X2, Y2. X2 is a distribution over n, it's a Completely arbitrary distribution has been overlapped with x1, doesn't matter. But again, in x2, the player is playing uh, only step, putting non zero probability on at most s rows. And so you have such a generic set of tuples of probability distribution. The result says that for such a set of observed equilibrium strategies, I can find a matrix of rank 2s plus 1 such so that these observed strategies are equilibrium. Support size is S, doesn't it? So it condition of the rank of the that, That's exactly what the. Yeah, that is good. But why is that? I'm not missing the depth of the. Result. Yeah, it's not. Uh, so, I, I mean, a priori, there's no sort of. Uh, so, it's not uniform distribution, so these can be arbitrary distribution. So, it's not. I mean, it's not a. So, that's where the fudge factor. Yeah, yeah, it's not it's not that I mean, even for the here if I give you on a diagonal, so it's it a very concrete example. I just have this set of observations. In the first observation, the both pairs are playing one one. There's no distribution, only one actually. So there's a support size one. The second distribution, I have uh, second observation, both pairs are playing two comma two. So no 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 randomization is this. So if you look plot out these uh, uh, observations, if you look observation lie on the diagram. One explanation is the identity matrix, right? But it's full rank. So it's not obvious that for such how is the, if there's a low rank matrix this kind of thing. And this is a, like in this result it uses polynomials and so it's not a it, it uses the like interest it connects to polynomials in somewhat a, a non trivial observation. So I, I explicitly look at certain low degree polynomials and I can show that we use those to get the matrix. Not a, I think there, there are some in detail certain And we have similar results for, and so higher, mention one result, but I don't know. It's clarified. I mean, it's yes. not that, uh, it's going that there is a basic assumption that, that all of these come from a single A and B, right? So if I give you, yeah, so if I give you just some, you know, the, the sequence of, uh, Vectors x1, y1, x2, y2 yeah. of support s. Yeah. Then it's not clear that they they actually you need the additional assumption that they also come 
they are the observed Nash equilibria of A comma B. Yeah, but from a technical standpoint, this this makes sort of the result more challenging. If I have different matrices, I can just for each I can come up with a new matrix. No, no, no. So my, my question is that if, if you also, if I give you some arbitrary sequence x1 mm -hmm. x2 x k like a, yeah. all of support k, yeah. or all of support s, uh -huh. are you going to just given this yeah. and no other thing? Will you design a game of randomness this thing? Or are you saying <coughs> that there you use no, the no. condition that there exists an a and b, the existence of an a and b for which this would you? No, I, I can construct a. Okay, so independent of if I just give you some x1 minus x2 like you will construct the game game. Yeah, yeah. construct. Yeah, completely construct. If you allow to read on the day and multiple a's and b's can be given, then then your job is easier. It is. It is. I mean, for each so for a single observation, I can always have a zero sum. No, but that's not because then there may be, you know, there may be, uh, this is some, say for example, x1, y1. Yeah. There may be a support which is larger than x1, including x1, and larger than y1, including y1, yeah. which is also an actual Yeah. Right, so that, so your, you know, your a, b may be of that. It, it might be, yeah. So that is a, okay, so these are not the maximal. Yeah, these, as I mentioned before, I mean, those are sort of, you can <coughs> sort of uh, make this. So these are not generic. These are not generic. Uh, uh, X1, Y1 are not the generic of that support, of that situation. Yeah, yeah, there's some, and the, as they said, I mean, the tragedy is just a testing exercise. And yeah. the, the fundamentally, I mean, all learning, prediction, all of these have followed, but the first step, the first fundamental step is to understand if there is a uh, low rank and this result says that you can sort of add additional constraints like uh, these are the only equilibrium. So not the only. I mean I what I'm what I'm saying is that given the a system A B, you know, there is this for any equilibrium there's a tight set I comma J. Which yeah. is the you know the, the maximum. Yeah. So you you're you're not saying that this I and J would be the yeah, I'm not. So I'm just saying this. Like I think in a typical situation, people would play a generic element of I uh, and a generic element of J, right? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I'm just for yeah. now. I'm just saying this is okay. yeah, the first step. This is this is yeah. There are other properties we look at. <coughs> Intersection of these sort of chromatic number of the, of yeah. the data. And support size is just one uh, one such. So yeah, I mean the high level so takeaway message is that yeah, I mean in many settings if your observation is structurally simple, then you can come up with a structurally simple, computationally simple explanation, computationally simple game, and hence address uh, these uh, complexity barriers for Nash equilibrium. So along with Nash, we also have results for pure Nash equilibrium where the observations correspond to like single action choices of the two players. Great. So that's. Pretty much the end of the technical part of the talk, I presented two results. Uh, one on computation of approximate dash, the second one that uh, looked at the addressing hardness from a alternate, from a complementary perspective. And uh, so going forward, such po and the focus was on Nash equilibrium. All these results uh, address Nash equilibrium, have results for other types of equilibria. And going forward, it's natural to ask if such positive results can be obtained for other types of equilibria and for other settings as well. And one of the settings that I'm looking to explore in the immediate future are these games over networks. So networks are pervasive today and a lot of networks are, are now being studied with a, in a game theory context. So the idea is that our players and the players, the payoff of any player is influenced only by its immediate neighbor. So you have this network and the players are playing games amongst each other. And so this network structure over uh, this game. And the idea is to understand if if we can get again approximate Nash equilibria is hardier. And the idea is to understand if we can come up with algorithms for positive results for such settings as well. And from a technical standpoint, uh, and this is an interesting setting for me because Again, here, a lot of equilibrium computation problems can be cast as mathematical programs. And the previous results I mentioned also sort of leverage structures of particular mathematical programs to find equilibria or find approximate equilibria. And so going forward, I would like to understand the techniques and tools that I developed, like the approximate category version, whether those can be extended or applied to address approximate computation of approximate Nash in such settings. Another context where 
the mathematical programs and these tools naturally show up our markets. People bring price competition in the markets. But these are two specific examples of uh, domains that I want to look at, games over network and markets. My overarching goal in this domain is to develop a structural understanding of uh, approximation in game theory. The idea here is to identify classes of games that on one hand are computationally tractable and at the same time are expressive, they are able to explain large classes of observed behavior. So the sparsity result I mentioned is an example of such a result. The game is sparse, you find uh, equilibrium efficiency and so on. And another direction that I'm quite interested in uh, working on is optimization problems surrounding equilibrium. So I talked to you about a, a computation of a Nash equilibria, or computation of an equilibria in some context. But it's quite relevant in many settings to understand if you can find an equilibria that's optimal with respect to some objective. So for example, it's, it's natural to ask if you can find an equilibria where the sum of the player, payoffs of the players is maximum or find an equilibria, it's Pareto efficient. And so again, this is a very rich area of research and I'm quite excited to work in this. Great. So, so far I, I, I focused on uh, results in uh, algorithmic game theory, but in general I'm kind of interested in approximation algorithms, online algorithms, and broadly in optimization. There are some sort of topics in uh, areas that I have worked in, I was very happy to talk about these offline if you're interested. And in conclusion, I talked about the following four results today. Hopefully they gave you a sense of my sort of research interests. And I look forward to how these uh, results connect to your work. So let me stop. Thank you. Yeah, but but uh, my point was yeah, you can the mathematical programs like I didn't work So the the mathemat even the sparsity result that I had was uh, using this category to solve. No, no, I, what I mean is more yeah. philosophical viewpoint. Markets do you view markets as you know optimization problems or as game theory? So then you see market yeah. for example if you look at the fishing market. Sure, sure. Which is given by market clear conditions or Vargas here in particular are given by a very clear uh, uh, complementarity conditions. Exactly. So they have not seen it as uh, game theory. So that was the what we have worked on this fishing market. Fishing market, market sir. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I guess my point here was uh, So are you looking at markets? Are you trying to enlarge the definition of markets where you or are you looking at traditional formulations of markets and so right now, exactly so right now I'm looking at traditional. So one concrete problem that I'm thinking of is this exchange, uh, like this Tabuska kind of. So exchange economy, like this typical class. But those are not given. Those are those are given by market equilibria conditions. Right? Sure. Of, so of price discovery and so on. Right? But again, finding approximate and so on is, remains interesting. No, no, correct. Yeah. I'm just saying. I'm just asking you why have you called it game theory? Because they oh, okay. are uh, they are not strategic. Yeah, they are, so they are by by game theory, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, like, encompassing in game theory, sort of, uh, microeconomic, uh, should have been like the word. So, I'm not encompassing these definitions, I'm just saying, yeah, with these tools, what, what, what can one say? No, but you are aware, right? What yeah, I am, I am, I am, I am. Yeah, market clearing conditions are ideology. They are not based on they are not rationality or, or study. Yeah, these are yeah. complementarity. Yeah, they are basically based on ideology that the market clears and prices are discovered and labor is, uh, you know, sure, yeah. you find employment and so on and so forth. And yeah, then yeah. let me find the equilibrium. Yeah, yeah. So these are not really where you know, we we allow the players to have rationality and say that maybe I should not say this or say they have to So that's a different computation. Yeah, market. yeah, those are like prediction markets and so on. So that's 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 something different. Right? I mean here, what I'm working on is these classical standards. Yeah, the second thing you said right at the beginning is that, uh, you know, the algorithmic game theory, what really is the agenda of algorithmic game theory? Is it really just to compute national, is it really to support 
some economic computation, some computation that economic economists have posed, or does it have an independent agenda of itself? So I mean, kind of you, this is not a single. So that's one scheme of work, and I focus on the, what I wanted to talk about today. But yeah, I don't. So there's sort of a, certainly it has a it has. So I mean, fundamentally, the algorithmic game theory is sort of coming from an engineering design uh, core. Computer science is like it, it's sort of give design ideas rather than economics. It is sort of social science and sort of mm -hmm. analysis, and that. That fundamentally kind of uh, distinguishes these. No, so what I'm asking is that are there any uh, core agenda of algorithm, algorithmic game theory by itself, you know, which is which is not coming from economics? So yeah, like designing efficient, uh, I think, or like computation of equilibria. Like that's so that's again economic. Equilibria has been defined by economists. Sure. By economists. Uh -huh. So is there any? I mean, so for example, the adverb word. Yeah, you know that was not seen by economists before. Sure. So that's what I'm saying. Like designing so, certain uh, paradigms, or designing certain, or even uh, like analysis is like uh, so certain uh, certain like options is a very good example. Like so designing certain descending price options and so on. These are like algorithmic <coughs> game theoretic uh, <coughs> constructs rather than. I mean, just to kind of go back to what I say, and here it, the goal which can differentiate is, is design rather than give and give. Typically, game theorists are like uh, in, in the business of understanding or analysis, like a physicist. And this is the world, this is how it operates. How do you explain this? How do you sort of understand this? Whereas, algorithmic game theory is also sort of the core, it sort of separates it from, from some ideological sense from like, typical game theory, which is a design process. But okay, now I know these tools. Can I design an option? Can I design a game? Or can I design incentives that lead to efficient equilibrium? It's not like here's the world and here's the kind of stuff. Yeah. So in the Indian scenario, do you see any games which are working? I mean, have you tried modeling any you know, typical Indian scenario? I mean, there's definitely certain things that I think are quite useful in sort of Indian context. Like one of the examples is this uh, uh, thing called it's, it's being done in uh, commerce in Uganda, like these op on like text options, like these could do it's called, could do it's called, uh, and th there again I think that's a very sort of uh, good game theoretic sort of platform for uh, like pricing and sort of you know, something that certainly will fit in the experience. Thank you.